Hi, my name is Dan McCarthy and I am a professor of criminology at the University of Surrey. Um, I have had an interest in policing for around about 12 years. Um, my PhD thesis was originally on the topic of the police and multi-agency working. And uh, more recently I've started to kind of go back into the areas of police work, looking at research on issues surrounding uh, cross-national policing and the ways we can understand different policing regimes around the world, primarily in parts of Asia, um, which is a current area of expertise I'm developing. Um, in addition to that, I've been involved in work on in, imprisonment and looking at how prisoners change throughout the course of a prison sentence, and also the, the kind of relationships between imprisonment and family as well is another of my areas of expertise. But today's lecture is going to talk about policing primarily and in particular looking at the kind of issues around the, the history of policing and some of the reasons why the police first came into being. After that we'll talk some of the issues around the functions of the police. What do the police do on an everyday level? What are their kind of main roles and responsibilities? And then finally we'll look at issues around police trust in certain communities. How and why the police have gained and lost trust in certain communities. What sort of reasons can the police improve those trust relations which, relationships within communities? And what are some of the ways that the police can often lose trust? And what sort of factors and contexts can shape those, those more negative outcomes? For this first section of the lecture, we're going to talk about the history of policing and some of the ways by which the police's introduction in society can be understood. We're going to talk about the work of um, the Metropolitan Police, in particular the 1829 Metropolitan Police Act, which is seen as the kind of the formal beginning really of the, of the public police in, in England and Wales, followed by talking about what was happening actually prior to that point, before the 1829 Metropolitan Police Act, what was going on at those times, what sort of context was shaping policing before the introduction of the, the formal police in 1829. Then after that we're going to talk about some of the difficulties the police originally had when they first came into being, what sort of conflicts they had in communities, what sort of issues they had with respect to um, trying to build trust, trying to build legitimacy, what are some of the issues that often occurred with the police in terms of the sorts of principles and priorities that the police had to try and c conduct themselves by. Um, what we'll do after that particular section is we'll talk about some of the functions of the police, but at the beginning at least we're going to talk about the historical dimensions and hopefully that's going to give a good understanding of where we're really coming from in terms of the current state of policing in, in Britain today. You may have heard of Sir Robert Peel and Sir Robert Peel was the Home Secretary at the time of the 1829 Metropolitan Police Act, which was the kind of the, the formal introduction of the, of the police in Greater London. Subsequently to that, we had the police who operated under the sort of the 1856 County and Borough Police Act, which made it a, a compulsory order for all areas in England and Wales to have police forces. Yet, in many respects, although the 1829 Metropolitan Police Act is often cited as the formal introduction to the police, policing and many many kind of components of policing were going on way before the 1829 Act and I'll give you some context that hopefully is going to make that um, understandable. So policing prior to 1829 was, was formed of, of two components really. The first component was a, a large number of what we call private police and they weren't necessarily formally regulated by the state as the current, current public police are. They tended to be people who were effectively charged um, to investigate crimes on behalf of fairly wealthy people who had the money to be able to pay them. So for example, if somebody was conducting their everyday duties and found that an item was stolen, they might pay for a, one of the private sort of contractors, as it were, to go around and try and find where the goods were, where, where, whether the goods can be recovered. So private police officers tended to be privately paid by fairly wealthy individuals who had the means of being able to pay for that, usually to try and get property back into their possession and so on. That world of private policing at the time was a fairly kind of murky, uh, undesirable area of police life. What often happened was that you had people who were involved in a kind of fairly shady background of, of criminal involvement, criminal underworld investigation and so on, and therefore their knowledge was very, very useful and been able to track down potential suspects when trying to take a bounty from a, a private landowner, for example. 
So it tended to be very haphazard. And it tended to at times fall into something kind of on the borderline of vigilantism, where effectively a bounty was paid to certain individuals who would make it almost like a profiteering enterprise. So a famous individual in London by the name of Jonathan Wilde was, was actually a, a member of the criminal underworld, but then found himself involved in a lot of kind of policing investigations and trying to find individuals who were involved in crime and give that information to the authorities. So you had this sort of very kind of complicated system of private policing happening. But in the city of London in 1749, you had what's called the Bow Street Runners, and they were set up by a magistrate by the name of Henry Fielding. And the Bow Street Runners really were, were sort of the first kind of uniformed police um, force whose job it was to respond to try and catching suspects in London. They were paid by the magistrate's court for every conviction that they earned. So it tended to be a more response kind of based mode of police work as opposed to one that's perhaps more preventative and something that Peel was to later take up in the introduction of the 1829 Metropolitan Police Act. So in many respects, the Bow Street Runners were kind of the, the inspiration for the formal police in 1829. And their kind of work was really central to the kind of um, the base of having a uniformed public police presence in the city of London.